You're listening to the Weekend Sport Podcast with Jason Pine from Newstalk ZB. With the first pick in the 2023 NBA Draft, the San Antonio Spurs select Victor Wembanyama from Montar, France. Yeah, to the surprise of absolutely nobody, seven foot five Frenchman Victor Wembanyama drafted number one by the San Antonio Spurs in the NBA draft a week to ten days ago. He's being touted as a generational talent by almost everybody. Pat Garrity played a decade of NBA basketball for the Phoenix Suns and then the Orlando Magic. He also spent time in the front office of the Detroit Pistons and is now an analyst for 24-7 Interactive Sports Community Stadium. He was part of their NBA draft coverage, which attracted 8.5 million viewers online. Thanks for joining us across New Zealand, Pat. Uh, Can you explain, first of all, the main reasons behind this enormous hype around this player, Victor, Victor Wimbanyama? I think, number one, it just comes down to, like, the raw physical attributes of, of Victor. You know, we saw with Luka Doncic, who wasn't even the first overall pick. I mean, he, he, no question, was a more accomplished player at this point of his career, winning a EuroLeague championship and a EuroLeague MVP. Um, but I think when you just look at the potential, the tools, and just what – he does on the floor and how that projects into the NBA game. We just haven't seen anything like it before. Um, it's going to be interesting to see his immediate impact on the offensive end of the floor. It's just even the greatest players right now, if you look at the guys that are all NBA team players right now and MVP candidates, they it's, it's hard to contribute to winning basketball on the offensive end of the floor as a rookie. And and I would expect Victor to go through some struggles there. Where I think the interesting storyline is, is is on the defensive end of the floor. Um, and we, we talked about this in our draft coverage after Victor was drafted. There, there have only been four all-defensive team uh, players who, who made that team as rookies. And it's David Robinson, Tim Duncan, Nakeem Olajuwon, and Manu Bowl. Uh, I think that Victor has a chance to make an all-defensive team his rookie year just with some of the numbers that he's going to put up. So he's going to be a fascinating player to watch. The city of San Antonio, I don't think, has ever seen anyone like this, even though you know they've had – They've had the, the success that they've had. Um, he's just going to be an outstanding storyline in the NBA this year. It seems, Pat, like an awful lot of pressure to place on the shoulders of a 19-year-old kid, a teenager. Is there any indication that he will suffer under the weight of the pressure of expectation? Well, we are just now, I think, getting our first glimpses of his personality. He went on the J.J. Reddick podcast, Little Man of Three, and I encourage everyone to to go and listen to that because I think you get a really, really good insight into his personality. And he is confident to the extent where it doesn't come off as contrived or scripted. I, like he genuinely wants to be great. I, you, you get this sense of patience, um, knowing that it's going to take a little bit of time for him and, and focus where it doesn't seem to me if that, you know, he's going to run into adversity. We, we all do as professional basketball players. It, it, you don't get the sense that that really the kind of the slightest first hint, hint of adversity is going to knock him off his stride, but it's going to be difficult. It, it, I, the international basketball community's eyes are on him. And like you said, that's a ton for a 19-year-old to, uh, to, to deal with, but he seems to be a guy with tremendous perspective right now. What sort of San Antonio Spurs team is he coming into? He, well, he's coming into a team that's been completely rebuilt that has right now, I think, other young players with tons of potential, um, but that are not yet at that point where they can come together and, and win and, and compete meaningfully in the NBA. But on the wing, uh, they're really excited about Devin Vassell. Uh, Jeremy Sohan, their draft pick last year, who is – one of these multi-purpose type forwards in the NBA, dribble, pass, shoot, tr- tremendously high basketball IQ. Um, they have Keldon Johnson uh, on an extension, who's probably their best offensive player, um, and Zach Collins. So, uh, look, I don't think that this is a situation where they're immediately going to go out, out into free agency, even though they have the capacity to do it with, with a ton of cap space, to sign free agents to immediately compete. I, I think that they're going to add – you know, good culture type veterans around them that that 
that I think complement Victor's skill set well. Um, and they're not going to, I think, put the ball in his hands and look for him to be the leading scorer right away. I would expect them to add some some depth in the front court behind Zach Collins, who had a, a nice year himself, uh, and some help at the point guard position. But I think that they're going to continue to be a young team and to build slowly around it. Uh, Pat, give us uh, give our New Zealand listeners an idea of what typically happens in a situation like this. When a player like this gets drafted number one, how, how long would you expect him to stay at San Antonio? How long's his contract? Where do you envisage him being five years from now, for example? Yeah, no, so good, good, really good question. All, all rookie scale first round contracts um, are for four years, two of those being team options. And so your first two years are guaranteed. The team has to pick up the third and the fourth year options. And, and typically what happens when a player is successful, like we all expect Victor's going to be, um, he has the opportunity to sign a five year extension after the third year. So that's the remaining year on his contract and then four more new years. And so really that shows you the value of these first round picks is you, you have the ability to control a player for, for nine years. And just the way that the rules are written, the, the incumbent team has just been in such an advantage in, in offering the player more money than they could get as a free agent, where if, if, these, if, if a player like Victor ends up being an all NBA type player, an MVP type contender, um, he'll be in San Antonio his entire career. Well, uh, San Antonio fans will be pleased to hear that. Um, <laughs> who, who were the big winners, apart from San Antonio getting Victor? Who were the big winners for you, Pat, in the NBA draft? Well, I, I think Dallas did a, a, did a really nice job. What, what they did is they had the number 10 pick. A lot of, of the mocks had them picking a center named Derek Lab, who's a young, high-potential center out of Duke. Uh, they had him they, they had him mocked at 10 to Dallas. What Dallas did was they traded back to 12. Uh, they got off of a contract of a player that they, they didn't suspect was going to play. Um, and they still got Derek Lively at 12 and created some more flexibility for, for them uh, going into free agency. So I thought that they did a really nice job. Sacramento, who was also involved in a, a ladder trade with Denver, did a really interesting thing. Uh, they had actually attached the number 24 pick, so they didn't make the pick. Uh, to Rashawn Holmes, but by doing so, they opened up a ton of cap space, which has immediately led to some speculation of, hey, are they going to enter the Drayon Green sweepstakes and, and try to compete for him in free agency? So I think that's an interesting story to watch. Um, Portland, you know, I, I don't want to call them winners in this situation. They were a team under tremendous pressure because of the Damian Lillard situation. That's a team... Um, that hasn't performed well. He's entering the twilight of his career. He wants to win. They're not going to be able to do that there. Um, but I think that they did a nice job of picking the best player who was there, who was Scoot Henderson, and really not succumbing to the pressure of having to do something on draft night. I think they're in a position now over the next week or so to really determine what the best option is going forward for them. Um, so I think that given the the, the eyes on them, um, in the anticipation of the Demi and Lillard situation, I think they overall handled it pretty well. Did any player go significantly earlier than you thought or significantly later than you thought they might? Well, yeah, the, the two that everyone are talking about are, are number one, Jet Howard from Michigan uh, going to Orlando. Um, I, I'd have to look with pick. I think he went 11 to Orlando. That was significantly higher than than a lot of people had him scheduled to go um the argument for him is that he's six eight and he's one of the best shooters in the draft you could make an argument he's the best three-point shooter in the draft um had some flaws uh, on some of the other ends of his game not particularly athletic questions about his defensive ability but no question his ability to shoot uh, the, the analogy that i brought up to him was Cameron Johnson four years ago, the, the, the he was a four-year player out of North Carolina. The Phoenix Suns picked him 10. Everyone killed the Phoenix Suns, and Cam Johnson's turned into a pretty nice player who's going to get a massive contract in free agency. So that, that's number one. And then Cam Whitmore, uh, uh, the the freshman out of Villanova, 6'6", powerful build, athletic. Some mocked in the, in the week leading up to the NBA draft had him going four, five, six. He fell all the way to 20 to Houston. Now, there are you know, some rumors about it was, it was medical information that teams had that, that scared them a little bit. 
for Houston, that ends up being a tremendous opportunity. You know, Houston had the fourth pick in the draft, um, but they got a guy that a week prior to that people had going in the top 10. Um, so a lot of times those those situations where guys fall because of medical reasons become some of the best risk reward type of picks in the draft. And there was a wee uh, New Zealand connection as well. I'm not sure if you're, sure, if you're aware of Rayan Rupert, um, who was invited into the green room. I think he was the last guy in there, actually, which must be an, an uncomfortable situation. Played for our New Zealand breakers down, down here. Uh, are you aware of him, and, and, and what do you make of where he ended up? I'm not I'm not super familiar with this game. I know he's a young player, 6'8". I've I watched a little bit of film with him. Looks like a very fluid athlete, but a young player. Um, and, and what I'll say is, when you get picked in the later half of the of, of the first round, it's it's a, oftentimes a pretty good situation because more likely than not, you're going to go to a, a, a an established team, a winning team, plan your vets. You might not play right away, but you're going to be in a situation with winning culture. And as a young player, uh, a lot of times it pays to to be patient. Those first couple of years go by quickly, but if you can embrace the player development aspect of playing in the G League. Um, you know, and improving. A lot of times that can turn out well for guys picked there. Pat, it's been great to get your expertise and your analysis across New Zealand. You've really informed us and, and educated as well. We look forward to seeing what the uh, the story of Victor Wembanyama, you know, <laughs> becomes. What the uh, you know the chapters that he writes in the years ahead. But uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Excellent. It was, it was great being with you. A lot of fun. Let's do it again. Yeah, let's do it again soon. Thanks, Pat. Pat Garrity there, former NBA player, now analyst, uh, talking about the recent NBA draft. For more from Weekend Sport with Jason Pine, listen live to News Talk ZB weekends from midday or follow the podcast on iHeartRadio.